Hello, thank you for so much for joining the webinar. As part of the Caltech Alumni Book Club, we asked Dennis Slimcole to provide a talk from Einstein to LIGO, the history of gravitational waves and how it relates to black holes. Professor Limkohl's work focuses on the history and philosophy of physics, specifically of theories of gravity and space-time. After undergraduate and graduate degrees in physics and philosophy from Hamburg University, Imperial College, London, and Oxford University, he was first a postdoctoral fellow and then an assistant professor at the University of Wuppertal in Germany before becoming departmental lecturer in philosophy of physics at Oxford. Since 2015, he is the research assistant professor in history and philosophy of science at Caltech and scientific editor of the collected papers of Albert Einstein. Uh, please give a welcome to Professor Lemko. And then you can go ahead and start. Okay. <laughs> Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for coming. I'm uh, I'm very excited about this opportunity to tell you something about uh, the history of gravitational waves and related to that to the history of gravitational uh, of black holes, um, and how it all started and um, culminated in a way in the discovery of experimental discovery of gravitational waves in 2015. So the story starts uh, in a way in 1919. Uh, in 1919, uh, Arthur Stanley Eddington, a uh, British astronomer, went uh, to Principe in uh, Africa to uh, observe the solar eclipse of 1919. The reason he went uh, only one year after the end of the Great War was to see whether the prediction of a German physicist, Albert Einstein, um, would um, be confirmed and thereby overthrow Newton's uh, theory of gravity. And this um, expedition had enormous consequences, both politically and scientifically. Uh, Eddington discovered that indeed Einstein's prediction from general relativity that um, light, the, uh, the light of stars is being bent by the gravitational field of the sun if it goes close by, um, has indeed been confirmed. And thus Newton's theory of gravity until then uh, seen as the absolute pinnacle of uh, human thought had been dethroned and a new theory of gravity um, um, was now the state of the art, Einstein's general theory of relativity. And within a year, Einstein um, became by far the world's uh, most famous scientist. Here there you see a, a title uh, from a Berlin newspaper with Einstein on the cover, and it says, uh, you can't read that, but it says at the bottom, um, a new um, figure of world history, Albert Einstein. And that was at a time when uh, celebrity scientists, or indeed uh, any public knowledge of scientists was rather unusual. So uh, it's the beginning of uh, the general public even knowing scientists and um, the birth of the public reception of general relativity. So one of the core predictions of general relativity was, as I said, that um, light is influenced by gravitational fields. And that was, in a way, a combination of predictions of Einstein's special theory of relativity that he had discovered in 1905 and of the general theory of relativity that he finished in 1915. Because already the special theory of relativity, you know, has one, has, uh, one of its most famous consequences, E equals mc squared, that mass and energy are in a sense equivalent. And because light possesses energy, if um, energy and mass are in some sense equivalent, then light should also possess mass. And because mass is a source of gravitational fields and is influenced by gravitational fields, the quite simple thought was that light should also be influenced by gravitational fields, just like normal material bodies. And so um, light going by a uh, very a heavy body like the sun um, should be influenced by the gravitational field of that sun. And the reason that uh, brought in the eclipse is that uh, the effect is still comparatively small. So you would only be able to observe it if the path um, of the starlight goes, very, goes by very closely to the sun. And normally, of course, uh, during a normal day, you don't see the starlight. Uh, you don't see the stars that are close to the sun because the sun is too bright. 
So you only see them during an eclipse. And so all of these factors had to come together in order for Eddington to be able to confirm general relativity's prediction. So that happened in 1919. Uh, and uh, I think it was the by far the most famous uh, and maybe the most important experimental observational discovery of the century. Now, I think 100 years hence, so 100 years from now, we will say that the discovery of 2015 uh, is going to be the most important uh, scientific observational discovery of the 21st century. In 2015, uh, the LIGO um, measurement device, the uh, Laser Interferometric uh, Gravitational Observatory, detected gravitational waves for the first time. Gravitational waves are another prediction of general relativity. And um, already predicted in 1916 by Einstein as a consequence of general relativity, it took 100 years for them actually to be experimentally detected. And um, in the years to come, um, gravitational waves will open up a complete new view, a complete new window into the universe because all observations that we've ever made, both on Earth and in astronomy, are observations that rely on light, right? All observations, starlight, um, X-rays, uh, radio astronomy, everything we've observed so far relies on light signals. And gravitational waves is a complete new kind of signal um, and that we've only been able to, uh, to utilize for three years now and uh, can only guess at um, all the new things we're going to learn about the universe in the years to come. So 2015, LIGO discovered a gravitational wave signal for the first time. Whoops, you see it here. That's uh, from the original paper. And I'm going to say much more about what exactly happened then. So my talk is going to be about how um, uh, general relativity leads to the prediction of gravitational waves, what had to happen in order for them to be experimentally discovered, and how all this relates to black holes. Because you see already here in the original paper that announces the gravitational wave discovery um, from 2016, a few months after the discovery, the title of the paper is Observation of Gravitational Waves from a Binary Black Hole Merger. So uh, the, um, in a sentence, the relationship between gravitational waves and black holes is that uh, gravitational, wa gravitational holes, if they orbit one another, will emit gravitational waves. In fact, any massive body or any two massive bodies that orbit one another will emit gravitational waves. The reason that uh, it needs black holes for us to, uh, to detect gravitational waves is because they are the massive, most massive isolated bodies in the universe. And so the gravitational waves that they emit when they orbit one another, not to mention when they collide and merge, will be stronger than that of any other two bodies. Uh, and so we can detect it. But in principle, uh, the Earth orbiting around the Sun, the Moon orbiting around the Earth, uh, the Moon orbiting around the Earth, all emit gravitational waves. The only thing is that uh, the only signal that we're actually able to detect is uh, the emissions of uh, binary black holes, so two black holes orbiting one another. So the experimental discovery was in 2015. It took a few months to finish the data analysis, and I'm going to talk about that in detail too. Um, and um, already uh, last. Um, this year, uh, Rainer Weiss uh, from uh, MIT and Barry Barish and Kip Thorne from Caltech were awarded the Nobel Prize, sorry, 2017, for the uh, discovery of gravitational waves. Um, the reason that it's these three is because they were absolutely leading in the discovery even though uh, all of them and Thorne in particular argued strongly that it shouldn't be awarded to any individual or any triple of individuals, but to the LIGO collaboration as a whole. But the uh, Nobel uh, Foundation insisted that they can only award the prize to at most three people. Okay, so that's uh, basically the, um, the temporal realm that we're going to explore. How uh, things developed from 1915, when Einstein uh, found the final equations of general relativity, um, and 1916 and 18, when he predicted gravitational waves as a consequence, 
and what had to happen in order for them to be experimentally discovered in 2015. Here's the, the so, uh, a picture of the source system uh, of that gravitational wave. So the name of the gravitational wave that was discovered or that was detected on the 14th of September 2015 is GW1509-14, which is just the date. And since then, uh, half a dozen other gravitational waves have, to, have been discovered from different source systems. Okay, so here's uh, the outline of the talk. I'm first going to tell you uh, a little bit about the underlying theory, the general theory of relativity, uh, at the core of which are the Einstein field equations, which are the gravitational equations that uh, supersede Newton's law of gravity. And then I'm going to talk about how gravitational waves and black holes alike arise as solutions to these um, gravitational field equations. And then I'm going to speak about how um, um, from the theoretical prediction by Einstein in 1916 and 1918 of gravitational waves and the evolving of the concept of black holes in the 1950s and also of gravitational waves that carry energy in the 1950s and 1960s, the ideas that led to the construction of LIGO came about and um, what had to happen both on the theoretical and on the experimental side to bring about the actual detection of 2015. And I'm also going to say and uh, speak in detail about how we can uh, deduce from the gravitational signal, from the gravitational wave signal, what the source of the gravitational wave is, i.e. Uh, what type of black holes must have been emitted, must have been the emission source of the gravitational wave detected. Okay, so first uh, to the underlying theory. Um, in 1915, after um, well, depending how you count, at least um, seven years of work, Einstein finally found the new theory of gravity, the Einstein field equation. So he found the special theory of relativity in 1905 and started to work in earnest on the general theory of relativity from 1911. And the reason uh, that the name, uh, that the theories are called theories of relativity relate to something else that they do. So the special theory of relativity was about finding a theory that expresses the relativity of motion. The idea that uh, there is no objective state of motion, there's no objective fact of the matter of whether you move or not, there's only relative facts of whether you move with respect to something and that something moves with respect to you. And Einstein believed that motion only made sense as such a relative concept. And in the 1905 theory, he developed a theory uh, that could cover uh, all inertial motions, i.e. non-accelerated motion. And then he tried to generalize the theory further, trying to find a uh, theory uh, which would make all types of motion, including accelerated motion, relative. And to his own surprise, he found that in developing such a new general theory of motion, he actually had to develop a new theory of gravity as well, because uh, he discovered an intimate link between uh, inertial forces that you feel when you're being accelerated and gravitational forces. In fact, the main idea, the, uh, the, the main idea that brought about the general theory of relativity was the idea that in practice we can never distinguish between being subject to inertial forces and being subject to gravitational forces. And thereby, uh, he believed he had to construct uh, both a new theory of gravity and a new theory uh, of accelerated motion at the same time. Um, so in 1915, uh, after having uh, tried out and discarded about a dozen alternative new laws of gravity, alternative field equations of the gravitational field, Einstein settled on what we today call Einstein's gravitational field equations that you see here. Um, so on the left-hand side of the Einstein equations, you have a mathematical object that represents gravity, or the gravitational field, or rather the, uh, the um, gradient of the gravitational field, how strongly the gravitational field changes from one point in space-time to another point in space-time. And on the right-hand side, uh, you have the mass energy of matter. And this was actually the starting point of Einstein's development. In Newton's law of gravity, only the mass of a body is a source of gravity. 
But because of special relativity and the equivalence of mass and energy, Einstein realized pretty quickly that in constructing a new theory of gravity, both mass and all other types of energy had to be sources of gravity. And building on work by especially Max von Laue and Hermann Minkowski in the early 1910s, Einstein thus used this new mathematical object called the mass energy tensor of matter, which uh, describes the mass, the total mass, uh, momentum currents, the stresses, and all other types of energy that you can associate to a material body. And so now these, uh, this generalized uh, object uh, of mass energy rather than just mass is the source of gravity. And so the Einstein equations, what they describe is how the distribution of mass energy in the universe um, influences the gravitational field in the universe. And you see here that uh, in this um, um, sentence here underneath the left-hand side of the Einstein equations, I write gravity slash space-time curvature. This is because um, pretty quickly uh, the general theory of relativity has been interpreted as um, showing us that gravity is, after all, not a force, but an aspect of space-time geometry. So the geometric interpretation of the Einstein equations is the following. Normally, in the Newtonian picture of what gravity is, you think of um, the Earth as um, you know, the source of a gravitational field, and the moon moving around the Earth is moving in the way it does because of the gravitational force field of the Earth that it is subject to. So um, the moon, if left alone, according to Newton's first law, would move on a straight path. But because of the gravitational field of the Earth, force field, it instead moves on a circle around the Earth. So that's the Newtonian picture of gravity, of the nature of gravity. It's a force that diverts particle from their natural motions. Now, the geometric interpretation of the Einstein equations is that uh, gravity is not a force, but what we perceive as gravity is a curvature of space-time. So if you imagine space-time to be like a, like a bed sheet, which is, uh, if you stretch it out, is uh, completely flat, but then you throw something in, say the Earth, it will start to curve. And if you now throw the moon in or something else in the bed sheet, then the moon uh, will roll down the slope. And if you give it a bit of a you know, beginning um, velocity, it will circle around the Earth. And so um, what is interesting about this is that in this picture, the moon being subject to the gravitational field of the Earth is not being diverted from its natural path by a force, the straight path, is moving on the straightest possible path in this curved geometry. So that's the uh, geometric interpretation of the Einstein equations, the idea that gravity is not a force, but an aspect of space-time structure. And you will find this interpretation in virtually any textbook on GR, on general relativity. Um, one thing that we found out through our work on, the, uh, on Einstein's literary estate, on his handwritten manuscripts, publications, correspondence, is that Einstein himself actually opposed this interpretation. I think it's a good interpretation, but he thought it's not the best interpretation. He thought that rather than uh, thinking of gravity as being reduced to space-time structure, uh, we should think of the theory as unifying inertia and gravity in a way that makes use of geometrical methods, but that should not be taken as ontologically reducing gravity to space-time structure. So that's one of the results uh, at the Einstein Papers Project from the previous years, but it's not going to be my focus. What I'm going to speak about is the solutions of the Einstein equations. So here on the left-hand side, sorry, I have to stop pointing at the screen and instead use my cursor. Here on the left-hand side, you see the full Einstein equations where you have mass energy of matter on the right-hand side and the gravitational field or the curvature of space-time on the left-hand side. And um, the more, mass energy you have in a region of space-time, the stronger the gravitational field. And if you move the matter in some region of space-time, it will also change the gravitational field in that region. Now, a special case of uh, the full Einstein equations is the case where you have no mass energy in the universe whatsoever. So you only have 
the gravitational field or the curvature of space-time. Einstein originally believed that in the case where there's no mass energy, so no gravitational source, there should not be any non-trivial solution to the Einstein equations. He believed if there is no mass or no mass energy, there should not be any gravity. One of the big results in the years since uh, 1915, in fact, many of, you know, loads and loads of results from the last 100 years is that the equations, the vacuum equations by themselves have lots of important solutions. And in both cases, and that's basically gravitational waves and black holes are solutions to the vacuum Einstein equation. And that is prima facie incredibly puzzling, and I'm going to keep coming back to what this means and uh, how different historical figures, how different physicists have puzzled about this. But first, the general idea, what is a solution? What does it do? So the Einstein equations are, if you want, um, the law about how mass energy and gravity relate to one another. And every solution to these equations represents either a possible universe or a part of the actual universe that is possible according to GR. So if you use GR um, in cosmology, you will look at solutions to the Einstein equations that describe the universe as a whole, the large scale structure of the universe as a whole. But you can also use the Einstein equations to describe particular subsets of the universe. For example, just, um, this, uh, just the solar system, our solar system, or just the sun and Mercury orbiting around it. And each of those uh, physical situations will correspond to one or the other solution of the Einstein equations. Okay, and our topic uh, is um, gravitational waves and black hole solutions. So the solutions to the Einstein equations that we interpret as representing gravitational waves on the one hand and black holes on the other hand. Uh, <clears throat> and both um, the stories of both types of solutions originate in uh, 1916. Einstein had originally thought that his equations were too complex, uh, too mathematically too complex to find an exact solution. He only ever looked uh, in this decade for approximate solutions. And so it came as a big surprise to him when already one year after he had published his final field equations, uh, Carl Schwarzschild, a mathematical astronomer, uh, published a paper uh, in which he gave the first exact solution of the Einstein equations. And Schwarzschild's starting point was a paper by Einstein from the year before in which Einstein had, in, had uh, investigated an approximate solution that he wanted to uh, use to predict the path of Mercury around the sun. So that was one of the big three uh, predictions of general relativity, um, the, uh, namely that in Newtonian theory, there had uh, a discrepancy had been found. Mercury didn't move uh, as Newtonian theory predicted, as had only been found in the late 19th century because the um, uh, telescopes were getting more precise. So one found that the prediction didn't fit. And uh, Einstein's one of Einstein's first calculations in the framework of the newly found uh, general theory of relativity in 1915 was to calculate uh, how Mercury would move uh, in the gravitational field of the sun if the gravitational field of the sun is described by a solution to the Einstein equations. But he only found an approximate solution. And Karl Schwarzschild, uh, while uh, hiding in the trenches uh, during World War I and trying to, you know, um, think of something else, uh, calculated the exact counterpart of that solution and found the exact solution uh, corresponding to Einstein's approximate solution that both he and Einstein interpreted as representing the uh, exterior gravitational field of the sun that Mercury and all other bodies are subject to. Now, the funny thing is that uh, quite often you will hear in a talk that uh, originally Schwarzschild's solution to the Einstein equation had been misunderstood and that it took until the 1950s or the 1960s until people understood that Schwarzschild's solution represents a black hole. And there's some truth to that. Schwarzschild's solution to the Einstein equations can be used to represent a black hole, but it can also be used to represent the exterior field 
of the sun. And in fact, both Einstein and Schwarzschild used it in that way, predicted the perihelion of Mercury and um, thereby accomplished one of the great early successes of general relativity. So I think it's fairer to say, and this is conceptually very interesting, that you can use one and the same solution to the Einstein equations to represent two very different physical systems. On the one hand, a star, a living star, and on the other hand, a black hole. The two are, of course, intimately related. They're both spherically symmetric, which is one of the mathematical properties of the Schwarzschild solution. And uh, a black hole is the end state of a star. In fact, uh, early on, before the name black hole had caught, caught on, many people called these objects frozen stars because they're essentially stars that have run out of fuel and collapsed. Now, um, you need to, uh, you know, you need to twiddle with the mathematics to use, uh, uh, of course, in order to represent uh, a star, you do something different with the Schwarzschild solution than with a black hole. You constrain the coordinates in a different way. And so there's no indeterminacy. It's just that you have one solution to the Einstein equations that you can use in two very different and two very important applications, namely to represent either stars or black holes. <clears throat> Another solution, again, an approximate solution to the Einstein equations that Einstein found in 1916, were wave solutions. Um, and here uh, he used the same approximation technique as when he found the, his 1915 solution that Schwarzschild then found the exact solution to. The uh, important difference is that it took decades until anybody found an exact solution that corresponded to even to just to some extent, to Einstein's 1916 approximate solution for gravitational waves. And <clears throat> um, that is one reason why Einstein was always skeptical about whether gravitational waves actually exist, because he had found them as an approximate, approximative solution to the field equations, and he wondered whether, they that was, uh, whether these wave-like solutions were an artifact of that approximation. Well, so I said he predicted uh, the existence of um, gravitational waves, at least in that approximate limit, in 1916. But uh, he made a big mistake in that paper. And it was the Finnish physicist Gunnar Nordström who uh, pointed out that mistake uh, in correspondence with Einstein. And so Einstein had to write a quick follow-up paper in 1918 in which he gave the actual um, derivation of uh, gravitational wave solutions that we still use today. So um, I say that uh, it's an approximate solution, which means that you can use it far away from the source. But given that, you know, when a gravitational wave that hits the Earth is far away from its source, normally black holes, um, we can still use Einstein's 1918 equations to describe these waves. So, but what are gravitational waves? I mean, uh, what, I mean you all know water waves. Uh, which look like this, right? You throw a stone in the water or two stones in the water and they will give rise, uh, give, give rise to these wave patterns. And one important, maybe the most important property of these waves is that they superpose. So if two waves hit each other, the first wave is this high, the other wave is this high, they will superpose and create an even bigger wave. Now, um, and also, um, they, um, you know, they are transversal waves. They have these waveforms like this, like you see in ocean waves. Now, gravitational waves are different in two respects. First of all, um, they only superpose in the far away regime. So when they're far away from their source, if you have to describe them by exact solutions of the nonlinear Einstein equations, you can't superpose them. And the second difference is about the the wave forms. So a gravitational wave, like the one that was discovered by LIGO in 2015, has the following form. I have a little video here. Focus on uh, the beginning uh, on, the, on this tube here. So this is what happens uh, to points in, uh, in space-time. So each of those points here is a point in space-time. And they have a certain separation, a certain distance from each other. And if now these points are hit, by a gravitational wave, they're being deformed in this way. In this direction, 
that um, um, being separated and at the same time uh, or the, the distance grows and at the same time the distance um, shrinks in the opposite direction. Do it one more time. So what a gravitational wave does in this geometric interpretation is to change the distances between space-time points. And if there are any objects on those space-time points, the material objects, the distance between these objects will change as well. And that is core element of the uh, later detection of gravitational waves. Now, uh, both black holes and gravitational waves are described by solution to Einstein's vacuum equations. So no material source, nothing that possesses mass energy is assumed. And yet we can find solutions to uh, these vacuum equations that are capable of describing both gravitational waves and uh, black holes. Now, uh, given that black holes are the heaviest and thus in a sense, the most material objects in the universe, this is incredibly surprising, right? You, there should be solutions to the full Einstein equations with mass energy. Part of my own current work is to make sense of this. Likewise, a binary black hole, so two black holes that orbit one another, a binary black hole needs to be described by a solution to the vacuum Einstein equations. But nobody up until now has found an exact solution describing um, an in-spiraling black hole, so two black holes that orbit one another and get closer and closer to each other and finally merge. Possibly no one ever will. And because no such exact solution that would describe such a system is known or has been known, this brought about a complete new field called numerical relativity, which is a discipline that uh, started in the 1970s and you know, picked up much more speed more recently with bit better and better computers. But it's a discipline that uses supercomputers to solve the Einstein equations numerically in the absence of us knowing an analytical exact solution. Now, one interesting question is how the corresponding communities and the corresponding endeavors experimented gravitational wave astronomy on the one hand and numerical relativity describing black holes and the emission of gravitational waves. How are these endeavors and these communities intertwined? This is a picture of a room uh, of a supercomputer. This whole thing is basically one uh, big supercomputer. And this brings us um, to the uh, history of LIGO and how it all came about. So in a way, the history of LIGO uh, starts in 1952. So I said at the beginning that 1919 was the big success of general relativity because Eddington, you know, in a dramatic way, showed a confirmed general relativity by observing an eclipse. But between uh, the mid 1920s and the early 1950s, not that much done, not not that much research was done in general relativity. There were some Einstein, of course, and his collaborators. Uh, and uh, other people at other universities, but it was like a few dozen people in the world between the mid 1920s and the early 1950s who worked on general relativity. Main reason for that was because everybody else was working on quantum mechanics. That's where you know the uh, the hot topics uh, of the time were. But in the early 1950s, uh, things changed and people got interested in gravity again. And um, one of the earliest real conferences on general relativity and on gravitational theory was uh, the 1952 Chapel Hill conference at which uh, both Hermann Bondi and Richard Feynman independently uh, came up uh, with a thought experiment in which they gave a new uh, perspective on gravitational waves. Now you ask how, how can they be at the same conference and independently came, come up with the same thought experiment. The reason is that Bondi gave the thought experiment on day one of the conference. Feynman was a day late and gave the same thought experiment on day two, not knowing that Bondi had already made the same argument the day before. So what the question was about was still, I mean, I told you before that Einstein was skeptical whether gravitational waves actually exist because he had only found an approximate solution to his field equations that are wave-like, and he wondered whether um, these solutions are an artifact of this mathematical approximation. Connected to that was the question of whether gravitational waves carry energy. Um, 
given that uh, they are solutions to the vacuum equations, so there's no mass energy source, and also nobody had ever managed to define a mathematical project, a mathematical object that would pre represent uh, the energy um, of a gravitational field in the local region. Now, both Bondi and Feynman said, well, this is all fascinating, great theory, but there's a simple mathematical thought experiment uh, that can convince you that gravitational waves actually do carry energy. And it's called the sticky bead argument. So uh, the setup is the following. You have uh, a stick and you have two rubber bands alongside the stick and they are flexible, right? I mean, they can easily be moved. Now, if a gravitational wave hits the stick, then uh, everything will expand or contract in the way I described to you, right? The gravitational wave expands and contracts uh, points in space-time. And that will happen to the stick and to the rubber band alike. But because the rubber band is flexible, uh, it will move and the elements of the stick are not because they're kept together by molecular forces, the rubber band will move up and down when the wave hits. And Feynman and Bondi argued, when it moves up and down the stick, the rubber band, that will create friction. Friction is a type of energy. Where can that energy come from if not from the gravitational wave that hit the stick? That's the argument. Um, I think one, one can criticize the dialectic of that argument, but it was an incredibly influential argument uh, in the uh, emerging community of gravitational wave research. And uh, in a way, arguably, Ray Weiss's uh, original idea for LIGO is uh, based on the sticky bead argument. So uh, he went from this general uh, sticky bead thought experiment to uh, the idea of a, laser, uh, of a laser interferometry. So it's set up in the following way, and you will see the, uh, the similarity to the sticky bead argument. You have a laser source. It uh, hits a, a beam splitter here that splits the laser into two beams, one going this direction, one going that direction. And at the end of the path, there are two reflecting mirrors, one here and one here. And uh, you know, the, the light is reflected, comes back and merges and is being detected here. Now, if uh, you, you can set up everything in such a way, and that's basically what LIGO does, that these mirrors here, the mirrors at the end of this, are uh, corresponding to the rubber bands. They are incredibly, you know, freely hanging. Even a small disturbance, can be a, a truck going by, it can be a gravitational wave hitting uh, the instrument, will make them vibrate a little bit. And if they vibrate a little bit, then uh, the interference pattern that you get from the reflected um, mirrors and that is being detected here will show this. And that's essentially the gravitational wave signal, the vibrations that you detected in these mirrors measured by the lasers that reflect from these mirrors. That's the setup of LIGO. And it's a, it's, in a way, it's a very simple setup, but as so often, actually constructing it uh, at the relevant scale so that your measuring, measurement precision is high enough to actually uh, detect gravitational waves um, is more complicated. So you needed to build them very big. So here's the LIGO Hanford, the LIGO Livingston um, LIGO observatories. And they're basically exactly what I just showed you. You have these two arms here at the end of each of these arms is a mirror. Here's the laser source and uh, the, the lasers will be reflected. And if a gravitational wave has hit and the mirrors will have started to shake, you can measure that pattern corresponding to the gravitational wave that hit the detector uh, in the photodetector back here at the base. Okay, so uh, what happened uh, on the 14th September? of 2015, the first experimental detection of gravitational waves. And how did uh, theory and experiment interact in that event? So first, uh, here uh, you see um, a graph from the original LIGO paper that announces the discovery of gravitational waves. And you see two things here. First, you, you see the source system, the two black holes that orbit one another and in spiral. So the orbit gets smaller and smaller. At some point they collide 
and they merge to a yet bigger single black hole. And all the while, while they're doing that, uh, they're emitting a gravitational wave. And the gravitational wave becomes strongest during the merger event and peters off uh, after the merging has happened. And each object involved in all of this, both the two black holes and the gravitational wave emitted, are described by solutions uh, of Einstein's vacuum equations. Now you see here that um, in this graph it says the red line is numerical relativity and the gray is the reconstructed template. So what exactly is happening here? Well, first, here again, here's the um, more schematic version of the measurement device, uh, the LIGO interferometer. You have a laser beam goes here, split in this direction and in this direction, reflected here, comes back, detected here. And the gravitational wave hitting the whole thing will make the two mirrors shake in, uh, in a way that allows you to, uh, to say, uh, to, to deduce the form of the gravitational wave that hit them. Here's again um, uh, the wave that would hit them, the, uh, the, the form of a gravitational, of a typical gravitational wave hitting these mirrors. So that's the, um, the signal. The source, as I said, is a binary black hole. And this is the data that is being produced. And uh, one can spend a lot of time, uh, you know, um, deconstructing it or uh, understanding the different elements. So here at the top, you see the actual signal that is being detected. Here, you see the gray area is what uh, numerical relativity tells us the wave should look like. And this is, so to speak, what happens if you, uh, if you take this, um, uh, sorry, this minus this, and this is the residual, or if you want the noise, the background noise. And here's one for Hanford, for the LIGO detector in Hanford, and one for Livingston. Now, um, one important role in all of this is, and uh, the way that you really link the gravitational wave signal to the binary black hole source system is uh, by templates. Um, I'm going to tell you what, what a template is. They're being uh, produced by the SXS collaboration that was uh, started primarily by Kip Thorne at Caltech and has since grown uh, uh, to, uh, just like LIGO, uh, to encompass many different institutions. So basically what happens is that using numerical relativity to solve the Einstein equations on a supercomputer, a whole range of binary black hole pairs with very different masses uh, are calculated. So you, you take, you say, okay, I start, uh, I want to calculate what happens if my first black hole has 20 solar masses, my second black hole has 30 solar masses. I start, I um, orbit, they emit a gravitational wave, and the simulation um, using the numerical relativity code will then tell you how, uh, what type of wave signal uh, a gravitation, uh, a black hole with 20 and one with 30 will produce. And then you do the whole thing again for one that has 10 solar masses and one that has 40 solar masses, and again and again. And thereby you create a gravitational wave catalog. It's a, basically, it's a huge catalog with hundreds of um, uh, gravitational wave forms that tell you, um, given a particular source system, the wave will look like this. Given another source system, the wave will look like this, and so on. And so when LIGO then detects a wave of a specific form, the uh, guys from the LIGO collaboration compare the detected wave to their waveform catalog, and thereby can tell what the source, the binary black hole source system must have been, and what the masses of these binary black holes must have been that emitted the gravitational wave. So that's one way in which these templates these results of uh, computer simulation solving the Einstein equations numerically are being used for. The other way that they're being used is uh, as a filter for the incoming data. Because more often than not, uh, the, there's so much noise, right? A lot happens uh, both on the way from the black holes to, uh, to Earth and also around us. There's all types of um, you know, other little vibrations 
that could uh, disturb the mirrors. And um, so in most cases, you won't be able, in the data that arrives, you won't be able to see the gravitational waveform. So they use the waveform catalog to filter the incoming data. It's a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack while allowing yourself to search for a needle of a particular form or color. OK, um, now some remaining conceptual, historical, and physics questions. Uh, following on from what I uh, just said, you might ask, is the filtering process problematic? Does it introduce a bias? Well, um, you, uh, there is a danger to that. And people at the LIGO collaboration uh, try everything they can to make sure that um, they compensate for, the, for that possibility. Right? They use as many different filters as they can. They have runs without any filter uh, and try to reduce uh, a possible bias. But the thing is also that without these templates as filters, uh, you wouldn't be able to get much done. So you, in a way, you're, you're bound to them. So you, all you, you can do at the moment is to try to reduce um, uh, any possible bias. A second question you might ask is, uh, Einstein himself was very skeptical about whether gravitational waves actually exist. Was he misguided? I, I myself have attended many talks in physics departments where it's often presented like this. Well, Einstein predicted gravitational waves. And then during the 1920s and the 1930s, he uh, sort of uh, lost it a little bit and started to, um, to doubt his own uh, prediction. And that, I think, is way too simplified. He was worried at the very beginning because of the way he predicted them, using the approximations you had to, he had to use to do it. Uh, he was worried whether by using these approximations, he was creating a mathematical artifact that these waves are. Only if he had ever found uh, an exact solution to the Einstein equations that corresponds to gravitational waves would he have been satisfied. And um, there's a whole beautiful story about what happened in the 1930s when he thought he had found a non-existence proof for such solutions. And then a referee, uh, which was H.P. Uh, Robertson at Caltech, referee uh, wrote a referee report in which he said, actually, that's not really what's going on. And then before publication, Einstein flipped it around and used roughly the same argument to argue for the existence of exact gravitational wave solutions. Third question you might ask is, does the discovery of gravitational waves by LIGO tell us that general relativity is true? Or is the discovery compatible with different theories of gravity? At the moment, the answer to that is it's an open question. With only two detectors, I mean, first of all, it has to be said that other theories of gravity that have arisen since 1915, especially during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and even more recently, alternatives to general relativity that contain general relativity as a special case, um, they're all compatible with the existence of gravitational waves, and they all predict them. But general relativity is the simplest of these theories. And as a result, it contains only the simplest gravitational waves. And with only two detectors at the moment, we cannot distinguish between a wave that is a GR wave and a wave that is um, uh, a wave that is not compatible with GR but with other theories of gravity. And that is one of the most exciting things that will happen in the next few years when uh, LIGO India and um, uh, Virgo in Italy uh, start taking data uh, at the same position as LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingston, when, because then you can distinguish between GR waves and uh, waves that are only compatible with alternatives to GR. So it's uh, very much to look forward to. So. To sum up, uh, I think it's a beautiful history, much of which is still not historically researched properly. So I've only given you a glimpse of some of the work, even the work that Einstein did uh, in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, not to mention uh, things that happened in the 50s up until now has been historically properly researched. And um, just like um, the physics of gravitational wave research is only just beginning at the same in the same way the historical understanding, the historical work, and the interpretation of conceptual work, trying to make sense of it all, is also only just beginning. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have had a couple of questions come in mm -hmm. um, while you were talking. Um, 
one of them was um, just a very uh, kind of simple, I'm hoping simple, but if you were in the vicinity of two emerging black holes mm -hmm. um, and experiencing it, would um, you be able to see anything or sense anything? Or do you think if you were like right next to them? If you were right next to them, um, you would, I mean, you would, I mean, even if you were quite a bit far away, you would be pulled in. Um, and um, you would, um, so the uh, important region is the event horizon of the two black holes. So the event horizon, um, that's one of the things that were only really started, uh, people only really started to understand what an event horizon is in the 1950s and 60s. It's basically the region around a black hole where if you, uh, if you cross it, uh, you cannot get out again because no matter what you do, even light, is the gravitational field is too strong. There's no way out anymore. And um, because of even the small uh, differences and how strong the gravitational field would be between your head and your feet, you would basically be ripped apart while you're falling in. Uh, so okay. that's, that's what you would observe. <laughs> yeah. And then um, one question we had was, um, how are the solar masses determined and how is the distance to the event determined? Right. So the solar masses are determined uh, in the way that I, I, I described here on this slide. So you, uh, you've done these simulations. You tr basically tried uh, as many possible combinations of black hole one has this and this mass, black hole two has this and this mass, and you see how they evolve with a computer simulation and what kind of gravitational wave signal uh, two black holes of these masses would produce. And then when you detect a signal, you compare uh, the detected signal with your waveform catalog and thereby say, well, so the detected signal looks just like this wave. And I know from my simulation that this wave would be, would produce, uh, would be produced by two black holes where one is 20 solar masses and the other one is 30 solar masses, for example. That was the second question following that, right? Uh, yes, uh, yeah. it was. Um, uh, yes, that that's it. Um, so someone uh, is reading Einstein by Isaacson, yes. and evidently Einstein was always torn by the duality of light, photons, and waves. Is there a reason to invoke gravitational photons? Oh. Okay. Yeah. So it's true. He was torn. Um, that's a great question. Um, he was torn about how to understand light, right? I mean, it was one of his other big discoveries in 1905 was that while uh, there were lots of phenomena involving light, uh, which you could best explain if you describe uh, life as a wave, there were other uh, phenomena, other experiments that you could much better understand if you described uh, light as a, partic as a particle. And, um, now with gravitational waves, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So just like uh, we used to think of light as a wave and then uh, certain things happened that uh, suggested that we should also think of it as a particle in other situations, you could make the same argument for gravitational waves. Um, and I think with the same reasoning, um, but um, no phenomenon as far as I know has yet shown up, which would have pushed us to think of um of gravity as particle like um you expect that something like that would happen in a quantum theory of gravity because uh, in a way this whole uh, wave particle duality about light is the beginning of a quantum theory of light so similarly you would expect that on the way towards a quantum theory of gravity you would also start to think of uh gravitational signals as particles rather than as waves. And there is a name for that already. They're called uh, just like light particles are called photons, gravity particles are called gravitons. But even the theoretical foundation of that idea is still in early stages, even though Feynman already started working on it in the 1950s, but uh, not much progress has been made in that direction. And especially relating it to anything that could be observed. 
Wow, thank you. Um, can you say more about the lead up to LIGO and the other experiments that were attempted? Yes, uh, so uh, originally, uh, the first big uh, gravitational wave experiment um, was performed by um, uh, Joseph uh, Weber during already during the 1960s. So he had a completely different setup compared to LIGO. He had basically had a uh, a big uh, cylindrical bar, uh, and uh, he wanted to detect what a gravitational wave that hits that bar would do to that bar. And uh, Weber uh, announced that he had discovered gravitational waves using his instrumental setup uh, already in the, um, I think in the 1960s. And um, he, it was, you know, it, it was big news. Everybody uh, he gave talks everywhere and he was taken very seriously. But then within the 10, 15 years after that, nobody managed to reproduce his experiment. So that, um, so nobody else managed to do what he did. So that uh, in the end, a consensus formed that either uh, Weber had faked his data or he had just been a bit too eager and saw something that wasn't actually there. Right? Repro reproducibility is the big judge uh, in science. And uh, so that uh, controversy uh, still uh, goes on. I think most people uh, believe nowadays he didn't fake it. He really thought he had discovered something, but he had systematic errors in his setup that he misinterpreted as having actually found a signal. That was the, the one big other experiment before LIGO. Thank you. And we're almost out of time, but do you have a couple of extra minutes to go answer a couple of extra questions that have come in? Sure. Okay, awesome. Um, when the two black holes merge and the, mass, the masses will decrease, correct? If so, where does the reduced mass go? Right. So um, the total mass of the merged black hole is lower than the if you were to add the mass of the original two black holes. So in the gravitational wave that was detected uh, in 2015 on the 14th of September, the, the mass of uh, the resulting merged black hole uh, was three solar masses less than uh, the original two uh, added up. And the interpretation is that that energy uh, has been transformed into the energy being carried away by the gravitational wave. So that the gravitational wave that was emitted carries the equivalent of the energy of three suns. But what is interesting is that uh, the LIGO detection doesn't actually draw on, you know, describing what happens at LIGO doesn't actually need uh, the, the idea of a transfer of energy, right? You just see the shaking of the mirror. And you can also think of it as the distances between space-time points being deformed. So you can give a theoretical description of that that doesn't draw on the fact uh, or on the idea that um, the gravitational wave carried that much energy. And that's another thing that's quite puzzling. If it carried that much energy, and yet we can describe the detection event without having to use the, uh, the, the fact or the idea that it carries energy, that's puzzling, but interesting too. Yes, it is. Um, a couple of people have asked questions about the two neutron stars um, colliding. Um, mm -hmm. Can you speak to anything more um, about what that detection might have revealed, or um, has there been any other further detections since th that, the two neutron stars? Um, I think, as far as I'm aware, there's only one neutron star detection so far. Maybe there was a second one that was less telling than the first, but the neutron star detection is interesting uh, in, uh, I mean, in the same way as the black hole gravitational wave detection, but it offers more on top of it. because So basically, both black holes and neutron stars are the end products of uh, collapsing stars. The, the, the difference between the two of them is that it depends how heavy the original star was. Uh, if, it's, uh, if, if its mass uh, goes above a certain threshold, it will collapse into a black hole. If it's uh, in another mass range, it will instead collapse into a neutron star and remain it. So it will reach a stable uh, you know, life as a second type of star, neutron star. But they're also incredibly heavy and also incredibly compact, just like black holes. So they are like black holes, 
uh, the types of sources that emit strong enough gravitational waves that we can detect them with LIGO. And uh, the discovery of the neutron star had one extra important ramification that relates to one of the previous questions. Because neutron stars um, emit um, gravitational waves when they're rotating like this and finally merging, but they also still emit light in contrast to uh, black holes, right? So a neutron star merger will give us two signals. On the one hand, the gravitational wave signal, and on the other hand, the light signal, the light that was emitted in the merger event. And um, one question uh, that uh, had always been open was whether gravitational waves, if they exist, uh, move at the same speed as light, right? Uh, general relativity predicts that the speed of both of them have to be the same, but other theories of gravity allow for different speeds. So it could be that uh, gravitational waves are slower or faster, uh, are slower than light, that they have two different speeds. And um, now the detection of the neutron uh, star merger showed, I mean, the, they were incredibly close together, right? Within a few nanoseconds uh, the, after the gravitational wave signal, the light signal ar uh, arrived. And even that little difference was to be expected because um, the modeling of the neutron star event um, suggests that the light would be emitted a little bit after the gravitational wave. So now we have a very strong experimental bound uh, on uh, how uh, on the different speeds, and it's uh, they're almost at the same speed. So that puts a lot of pressure on alternative theories of gravity, some of which predict that they gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves have different speeds. And now we know they're almost the same. And so indirect, uh, very consistent with the prediction of GR. Thank you. Um, could you explain a little more about your statement um, about Einstein not thinking that the geometric interpretation of space-time was not the uh, correct way to think about GR? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I can say a bit more about this. If if you want to read up on it more, uh, I have a paper on that topic on my website. So uh, have a look there. But the basic idea is Einstein believed, yes, yes, uh, used geometric concepts like the concept of the, you know, the mathematical object that describes the curvature. But that's only the tool that he, in his mind, that's only the tool that he used to describe what really was gravity, right? And he said, well, it's just a tool. Um, and uh, a curvature tensor, which is that mathematical object, is not more or less geometric than a vector. They're both geometric objects in the trivial mathematical sense. It doesn't mean that we have learned that gravity itself is nothing but geometry. It's just a matter of what mathematical tools we use. And he believed that the main lesson of GR was not that gravity is nothing but space-time geometry. He believed that the main lesson of GR was that gravity and inertia are two sides of the same coin, and that what uh, uh, general relativity really shows is that gravitational forces and inertial forces are to be unified in the same sense as before electric and magnetic forces had been unified. Okay, thank you for that. Um, what are the periods, amplitudes of black hole gravity waves, and what is the time frame for the black holes to spiral in and then merge? Uh, that depends very strongly on how massive they are and how far apart they are um, at the beginning, right? Uh, so I think there's no no general answer. It very much uh, depends on the specific setup, where they, how far they start apart, and uh, how heavy they are. I think it can be anything from uh, hundreds of years to just a few years, but I'm not sure what the total range is. Right. I'm going to ask you one more question, um, yeah. and then I would just like to uh, let the people know that if we have not gotten to your question, um, I will also be including them into the Caltech Alumni Book Club. There's a forum, and we have Professor Alan Weinstein, who's a professor of physics and group leader of the LIGO Laboratory Astrophysics Group here on, question, uh, here on campus. He's, he's answering questions in the Caltech Alumni Book Club, so I will go ahead and ask questions to him through the book club as well, as he can probably speak to a little bit more of the specific LIGO questions that we're getting um, too. And so my last question is, 
In addition to non-GR gravitational waves, what other observations do you think we can look forward to in the next decade or so? Hmm. Well, there's also, um, in the next decade, it might, might have to be a little bit longer because, uh, so LIGO, because of the way it's set up, and uh, so all the Earth-based um, gravitational observatories can only discover gravitational waves in a certain frequency range. And so that frequency range is exactly that, which corresponds to those that would uh, be uh, emitted by black holes and neutron stars. But other types of events would have different gravitational wave frequencies. For example, there is the possibility uh, that directly at the Big Bang, just like a cosmic microwave background was being created, that there were primordial, i.e. resulting from the Big Bang gravitational waves. And these we could still detect today if we had, um, say, a gravitational laser interferometry that would orbit the Earth. And there is a project uh, an experimental project um, called LISA, um, um, which would launch a gravitational wave interferometry to orbit Earth, and that could detect this type of waves and many other types of signals too. And uh, I think at the moment, uh, the launch date is, um, is uh, in the late 2020s, but it's a bit unclear because uh, a few years ago, the US had opted out. And the question is whether the U.S. opts back in or whether the other partners in the collaboration can foot the bill by themselves. That's still to be decided. Thank you so much. And I cannot uh, express how much I appreciate you taking the time out to speak to us and the Caltech alumni community. Um, I'm getting very positive feedback and many, many thanks from our alumni in the um, in our little chat question area. So I just want to say um, thank you on behalf of everyone else. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye.